Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Anybody came here to praise the Lord today? Anybody, you woke up this morning with your mind stayed on Jesus? The fact that he allowed you to sleep on last night and he touched you with his finger of love and woke you up this morning. Let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord because we know he is what? He is good, he is great, and he is greatly to be praised. So, Father, we lift your name in this place today like never before. God, we thank you for what transpired on this week. Thank you for our revival on this week. Thank you for Marsh Gladness, and thank you for your anointing that rested here. But, God, we thank you for what you're getting ready to do in this place today. God, for your anointing that rests here, for your power that rests here, for your healing that rests here. God, we thank you in advance for miracles. We thank you in advance for deliverance. We thank you in advance for saving. We thank you in advance for working miracles in our lives, God. And we will give you glory, honor, and praise for it because we declare that there is no other God like our God. No one is worthy like you are. So we bless you and we honor you and we celebrate who you are. Anybody just excited about Jesus today? Hallelujah. Be all glory, majesty, dominion, and power to our God as we declare. We praise and magnify your holy name. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I came to praise the Lord today. I don't know about you, but I came to bless the Lord today. Can you come to bless the choir? Come on. Right here, choir, repeat. Honor and power. Honor and power. Say it, to the one above. To the one above. That's it, now let your glory reign. Now let your glory reign. That's it, from heaven above. Of you, I have made new. Father, we worship you. Anybody came to worship our God today because he's worthy. Come on, let's take it higher. Real big choir. Honor and power be. Honor and power To the one above. I hear you say, now let your glory reign. Hey, from heaven above. One more time. Of you, because of you, I have made you. Have made you. Father, we worship. Father, we worship you. Do it again, Jehovah.
serve. What an awesome God we serve. What a great God we serve. And we come to praise. Praise your name, Lord. Because he's good to us all the time. And all the time, our God is good. Anybody can declare that our God is good. Look at the neighbor and say, he's been good to me. Come on, tell them, he's been good to me. Better to me than I could be to myself. We declare, God is good all the time.
Praise. Come on and help me thank God for the voices of Bayview this morning. You can take your seats in the presence of the Lord. Well, good morning. And just in case, I'm going to give you another good morning. And you can give that one to the people who show up late because I'm going to be past that. Springing forward. Somebody didn't spring forward enough. which means it's going to be a hefty seating at the second service. But thank you for going to sleep a little earlier <laughs> and waking up to be with us here today. If you are a guest here today, just wave at me. I want to see all the guests that got up early. Come on, help me thank God for all of our guests. We thank God for you, and I look forward to meeting you at the end of this service. Help me greet all of our streamers this morning who are viewing. Say, good morning, y'all. Now, some of y'all are supposed to be here. You just didn't get up early enough to eat your Cheerios, your Fruit Loops, or your Captain Crunch Berries, all berries, and now you're sitting in that bed. We see you. We think we don't see you, but we see you. We know who you are. And we, we get, you know what, we'll talk next Sunday when you're back in your seat. But thank you to all of you who are viewing from wherever you're viewing from. Go ahead and hit like and share and share this stream. And, uh, tell them it's not too late to come worship. They just woke up late too, so they can come on and get in church while they can. Jesus still loves them, even from the bedside. Amen. Amen. We thank God for them. So what about March Gladness? What about that? What about that? What about that? <clears throat> I tell you, every year is going to be special. I told you last week as we ended our reset series, uh, the Keon was going to put the icing on the cake. And he put the icing on there, didn't he? Yeah. And, uh, and tall joker then started planning for next year. I said, all right then. So we, we're back again next year. Uh, but we're looking forward to it. And thank you so much for your support, your attendance, your spirit, uh, your willingness to allow God to speak to you last Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. If you have served or you are now serving in the United States Armed Forces, come on and jump to your feet. We want to celebrate you. We want to celebrate you today. I thank God for you, for your sacrifice, and for your service. We have uh, something going on for you, and I'm, I'm getting up to preach early because I want you to be a part of what we're doing, another event we're doing to celebrate a Women's History Month. And you're, you're, you're here, well, I guess, uh, yeah, grab that mic. Come on up here, Mo, and tell them about what's going on. Y'all give it up for my wife. <laughs> I was going to start talking about it, but I probably mess it up, so I'm not going to talk about it. I would not mess it up. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Today is the day Women's Ministry is presenting her story exhibit right after this service and right after the 10 o'clock service. Right next door in the MLK, it has been, the stage has been set. Well, really the room has been set and the women are ready and prepared for you. So please stop by. It's a live experience. Just self-guided. Walk on through and then walk on out tell us how amazing your experience was. Okay, we look forward to seeing give, you. Give them a little more info about what they're going to see over okay. there. So we have selected women who have been influential in our history. And these women aren't your typical women that we typically talk about throughout, um, throughout the year and who we see um, put on display throughout the year. These women, I myself, are just learning of, am just learning about. And so we want to um, offer this opportunity as a learning experience for you as well to learn about some new women who have been very, very impactful in our history. And so um, bring men, women, children. It's for everybody, okay? Not just women. We're celebrating women, but it's for everybody, all right? So thank you so much. And, and so our women are... Portraying, portraying women, portraying and they're going women. to tell their story, right? Tell something about their story? No, they're, they're not going to tell the story. They're actually going to be the women. Oh, okay. Yes. All right. they're, they're actually portraying the women. Yes. And so let me say this, because this was one of the questions that they had yesterday. It is a live, it's a museum, right? And so most times, do you talk in a museum? 
No. So don't ask them any questions. <laughs> don't ask them any questions because they're going to have to say their, their monologues repeatedly, depending on the number of people that come through. So they're not prepared to answer your questions. They're only prepared to present their monologues to you, okay? Super excited. Super, super excited. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, and so, uh, so now, listen, here's what I need. I need grace. And I need your prayers because I really want to go to sleep. I really want to go to sleep. And so this is a new series, and uh, it's going to start off. It's going to start off slow, <laughs> uh, but but that's all right. This new series is this is going to hurt, but it will help. That's the new series. This is going to hurt, but it will help. And all of this series, we're going to be talking about how God uses pain for his glory. Everybody repeat after me. This is going to hurt, this is going to hurt but, it will help. but it will help. All right. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but you are mighty. Hold me with your powerful hand. Bread of heaven. Bread of heaven. Feed me till I want no more. It's me, Lord, asking your permission to preach. Hide me behind the cross and cover me in your blood that they see none of me but, Lord, all of you. Not for fame, fortune, or reputation, but their bowed heads be lifted. Broken hearts be mended. Some lost brother or sister might be saved. Please today, God, order my steps in your word. These and all things we ask in the precious name of Jesus. And all the people said together, amen. amen. Psalm 119 is the, the scripture I'm going to read today. I'll read several others in the message, but I want to read this one for your hearing. Psalm 119, verse 71. Come on and stand with me for just a second. <clears throat> Psalm 119, verse 71. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. When you got it, say got it. Got it. When you're ready, say go. go. The psalmist says, and this is David, It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than, a thou than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. Today, today, with God's power, with God's power and, our prayers, and our prayers, Pastor T's preaching about, T's preaching about positive pain. Positive pain. There are several different kinds of pains. There's physical pain. There's emotional pain. There's mental pain. There's relational pain. There is financial pain. And I believe there is something developing that we could probably call social pain. Somebody here today, somebody watching, may be struggling with painful memories. Painful losses. Here's a tough one. Painful truths that you're finding difficult to face about yourself. To never have pain would be inhuman. Sometimes Christianity is mismarketed as a step you can take to escape all the pain and hardships of your life. But there's no such thing as a pain-free life. Pain is inevitable. The problem is most people don't learn anything from their pain and thereby waste their pain. But I strongly believe in never wasting a hurt. I have no doubt that everybody in here at some time, maybe even now, 
has a point of pain in your life now, a point of pain in your life last year, a point of pain in your life, maybe even this month. What is pain? Pain is a warning light that something is, is, is going wrong. And ignoring a warning light does not make it go away. Ignoring pain, <clears throat> trying to act as if it doesn't happen. Sometimes we try to act so saved as if nothing can ever bother us because we're so saved. But even Jesus, well, pain has a purpose and God can use any pain in your life regardless of the source, God can use any pain in your life for your good. Regardless to whether it's the result of something good or bad, whether you brought it on yourself from poor choices or other people caused it and you're innocent. It could be Satan trying to attack you with pain and tear you down. It doesn't matter the source of the pain. God can still use it and make it work in your favor. Well, how can pain be positive because I've never heard anybody say oh God I thank you for my ouch <clears throat> how can pain be positive I I'm looking at your faces I know you're wondering where is he going to go with this and how many weeks of this do we have to deal with there number one pain can be positive because God can use it let's get into the outline real early to guide and direct me to guide and direct me so so many times even if we're not aware, God is behind the scenes using our choices, both good and bad, to direct our steps. Proverbs 16, verse 9, a person may plan his own journey, but the Lord directs his steps. Now, here's the truth. <clears throat> God, I believe, I believe, God would prefer just to direct us through his word. The problem is we don't spend enough time reading God's word, but he still has to direct us. So he uses a second way to guide us and direct us through something we all are going to go through. That's pain. Not that he causes pain, but since it's going to happen, he uses it for his own good. Job, 56, excuse me, Job 36 verse 15 says, he delivers the afflicted by their affliction and opens their ear by adversity. So, so uh, have you ever wondered why riders put a bit in a horse's mouth? It's not there for decoration. It's, it's, not, it's, not, a, it's not a southern fashion trend that still lingers on. Y'all didn't get that, you know, in the South, they wear gold. Okay, it's not, it's not a fashion trend. The rider actually puts this bit in the horse's mouth, which causes discomfort, and then uses discomfort to direct the horse in the direction he needs to go in. Sometimes, it only takes a little bit of pain to guide us, direct us, or redirect us in the direction God really wanted us to go in. And when King David realized that God was using the pain in his life to guide and direct him, and King David went through hell. King that hired him tried to kill him. His son wanted to take his throne. His enemies wouldn't leave him alone. He was always on the run. He was always in the war. And when he realized God was using this to direct him, he was grateful for everything he went through. He said, it was good for me that I was afflicted. It was my pain that let me learn what you wanted me to do. It was my pain that taught me my purpose. It was your pain that made me listen to your words. Quick question, has God ever used pain to get your attention? Has God ever used pain to guide you in a new direction? 
T.S. Lewis said this, God whispers to us in our pleasure, but he shouts in our pain. Pain is a megaphone. It's God's megaphone. Here's the good thing. Pain never leaves you where it found you. So let me keep moving. Number two, the reason pain can be positive is because God uses pain to gold and correct me. Now, somebody's saying, what in the world is gold? <laughs> you ever seen people working with cattle or sheep and they have this long stick? And sometimes they poke them to get them to go. That's a gold. It means to motivate. They would go cows and sheep to spur them into action. Pain is a catalyst. Pain catalyzes inactivity like nothing else. More Bible, Proverbs 20 and 30. Sometimes it takes a painful experience to make us change our ways. I said this a lot of times. We don't change when we see the light. We change when we feel the heat. <clears throat> think about it. And this ain't for everybody, but think about most people. When do most people go to the dentist? People don't pop up at the dentist and be like, my mouth feeling so good, take a look at it. Most people go to the dentist when they're in pain, and they consistently go after they've been in pain. When do most people go to the doctor? If you had years of inactivity and you're young, you don't think about the doctor till some one thing goes wrong. And then you at the doctor every time you think. <clears throat> you don't check your blood pressure till it becomes a problem. You don't think about your weight till something don't fit. When you go to grab something out your closet you haven't put on in a long time and it don't fit. Then you start thinking, maybe I need to shed a little. <laughs> when do you take your car to the shop? When it starts knocking and clapping and ain't nobody trying to come in? <clears throat> or when a warning light comes on? Sometimes it takes a painful situation to make us change our ways. Now, pain, does, pain corrects us, not punishes us. Amen. There's a difference. Somebody say there's a difference. When I grew up, people used to get on what they called, they used to get on punishment. Anybody remember that? The worst thing you can say to a child is your own punishment. Because parents shouldn't punish children. You punish criminals. Some of y'all saying they were a little criminal. <laughs> you didn't see their faces, yeah. They was like, they was like, Ugh. There's a difference between punishment and correction. Parents shouldn't punish children. The Bible says parents should correct children. Punishment is a penalty for the past. Correction is training for the future. Discipline is not punishment. When you correct a child, you're correcting them to keep them from doing what they have done, not because they've done what they've done. Discipline is training and correction. 
Sometimes in life when bad things happen to us, we believe or people will lead us to believe that God is punishing us when actually God is just correcting us. God doesn't punish his children. Why did he punish his children? Because his firstborn son paid the price for the rest of his children. Jesus has already taken all the punishment for every sin on the cross. Everything I could ever be charged with was nailed on the cross with him. And so God doesn't have to punish me for the past, but he does correct me for the future. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 8 says, God corrects all his children. Listen to this. And if he doesn't correct you, then you don't really belong to him. Say so. Say so. Our earthly fathers correct us and we still respect them. Isn't it even better to be given true life by letting our spiritual father correct us? Our human fathers correct us for a short time and they do it as they think best. But God corrects us for his own good because he wants us to be holy as he is. So God does not punish us, but he definitely does correct us. And write this down, and correction is the evidence of love. Why do I say correction is the evidence of love? Because it prevents corruption. See, what they, see how that works? Yeah. Okay, let me give you another, let me, another verse. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7. Let God train you, for he is doing what any loving father does for his children. Who ever heard of a son that was never corrected? Now, in this scripture, the words train and corrected go together. All right, let me ask another question, get you back. How many parents... Do we have in a room? How many parents have ever had to discipline their children? Now, how many parents would rather not have to discipline their children? But sometimes you have to do it anyway, not because you enjoy it or because they enjoy it, but because it's for their own good. God is the same way. He'd rather not have to correct us. He'd rather not have to discipline us. He'd rather not have to allow pain in our life. But sometimes the only way to train is through pain. Aristotle said, we cannot learn without pain. Anybody in here ever worked out? I don't want to say do work out now because then I'm going to be just mad. <laughs> but, but when you worked out, did you see a difference? Did you like the difference? But did you like the process to get to the difference? Because training causes pain. Bishop, when you're weight training, you have to break down your muscles. You have to tear them down. That's why they wear out doing the workout. That's why you feel that swelling. You're actually breaking down your muscle fibers. And then when you eat right after your workout, your muscles draw nutrients from what you ate. And it builds your muscles back with better material. And they start to lean out. And they start to shapen up. But it was the pain that made your training effective. Some people want to work out but don't want to work. I don't want to sweat. Then you don't want to work. I don't want to be tired. Then you don't want to work. But the only way to get better is through pain. Resistance. That's the only way you get strong is resistance. That's all weight says. You resisting it. You keeping that steel from breaking your chest. And God uses the things you have to resist in your life the same way. So what you got to do is you got to stop coming to a workout expecting it to be easy. Yeah, it's depression. Just resist it. Yes, it's anxiety. Just resist it. Yes, it's discouragement, but just resist it. And the more you resist it, the stronger you'll get. And what used to be your max will be your warm up.
Somebody shout, you can't learn without pain. And when pain comes, here's something important. You can't doubt God's motive. He's not punishing you. He's correcting you because he sees more in you than you see in yourself. Let me keep going. (laughs) Third way that we can view pain as being positive is to realize God uses pain to gauge and inspect me. In other words, God uses pain to see what's inside of me. God uses pain to test my character. You think teachers gave you tests because they didn't like you? Good teachers give exams because they've given you enough information to pass. Good teachers give you exams to match their expectations. Some people, you got two kinds of people. Some people are like eggs. Some people are like tea bags. You never really know what's in them until you drop them in hot water. Some people are like eggs. When you put them in hot water, what do they do? They harden on the inside. They dry up. Some people are like tea bags. When you put them in hot water, they change the flavor. When pain comes, do you harden or do you change the atmosphere? Job 7 and 17 says, He's talking to God. Why are people so important to you? Why pay attention to what they do? You inspect them every morning and test them every minute. So how does God inspect and test us? Isaiah 48 and 10. See, I have refined you. Though not as silver, I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. I've been in pain for a long time. You've been being tested. God uses pain to test my character. God uses pain to test my commitment. God uses pain to check your faith. The Bible compares suffering to a refining fire. When you heat gold, it burns off the impurities so that it's pure. What is God trying to burn off of your life? Because when they're refining gold, it only stays in the fire as long as it's impure. When, all the, when it lets go of all of the impurities, they turn the fire off. But the more resistant it is to the purification process, the longer it has to stay under the fire and the higher the temperature has to be. Gold is solid. When they dig it up out of the ground, it's solid. You look at it, you can tell it's gold, but it's dirty gold. Dirty gold is not worth as much as pure gold. It's still gold. It still has value, but you're not going to get its full value. When you go dig up some gold out of the ground, you can get so much an ounce. When you put it in the store under a shiny light after it's refined, you can get a whole lot more for it. Why? Because when they get ready to heat gold and refine gold, I told you before, they put it in the cauldron, it heats up, it liquefies because the heat, the affliction, the tribulation renders it powerless. And it doesn't have the strength to hold on to what it's been holding on to. It, affliction makes gold vulnerable because to make it vulnerable equals making it more valuable. But it only becomes more valuable when in the stage of vulnerability it lets go of what's polluting its value. 
And as soon as the refiner can look in the gold and see his reflection clearly, that means it's pure gold. He can take it out of the fire and it's worth more. But when his reflection is distorted, it has to stay in the fire and he has to turn the temperature up. I'm talking to somebody right now who can't figure out why it's so hot in your life, why it's so heated. It's because God is trying to get you to look like him and you're steadily trying to look like you. Why are you holding on to self-centeredness so long? Why are you holding on to pride so long? Why are you being so impatient? Why are you being so materialistic? I figured this was going to be a party pooper. Uh, I should have started this before, Mars Gladness. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 4 in the message paraphrase. I love how this puts it. Consider it a sheer gift, friends. When tests and challenges come at you from all sides, you know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. He's saying, bruh, it's a test. Pain is just a test. Here's the problem. Pain exposes the real you. Pain exposes what you're really like on the inside. Image and reputation is what everybody thinks you are. Character is what you really are. Your character is what you are in the dark, not in the light. Pain is a measuring tool. It's an evaluating tool. And our reaction to pain reveals a lot about us. You know, it's hard to maintain your image when you're in pain. (laughs) Shakespeare said, nobody can be a philosopher with a toothache. (laughs) Your faith is measured by your reaction to pain. Your commitment is measured by your reaction to pain. Your Christ-likeness is determined and revealed by how you handle pain. A lot of people wonder, uh, how do you continue to do stuff? And how how do you do this? When you lose a loved one, how do you do this when you're going through this life experience? Because my commitment is not impacted by my pain. My commitment is showcased during my pain. The reason why some people don't miss a beat is because they stayed on beat. I don't move to the beat of my misery, I move to the beat of my mercy. And if God keeps on showing me mercy, I'm going to keep on showing up for him. Pain shows you how mature you are. What does pressure reveal about your faith? Y'all remember the children of Israel? Okay, VBS is in July. Uh, The children of Israel were God's people. (laughs) And they were in Egypt enslaved. After about 400 years, God sent them a deliverer. The deliverer, his name was Moses. He was supposed to take them from Egypt to the promised land, Israel, the the promised land. It it was probably an 11 to 14-day walk. It took them 40 years. And the Bible says that they were in the desert being tested. God gave them seven major tests. And every time they failed a test, he just said, take a lap. Oh, you don't believe me? Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. Do you remember... 
how the Lord led you through the wilderness for all those 40 years? How did he lead them? Humbling you and testing you to find out how you would respond and whether or not you would really obey him. I want to talk to somebody who's going through pain in your life in any place right now. You any, are you in, a, in an emotional wilderness? Maybe God is guiding you. Maybe God is goading you. Or maybe God is gauging you. He may be seeking to inspect you to find out what you are on the inside. Does pain make you better or bitter? And we, we, we're here because, you know, we always, we get excited about it's going to be better. But what if it's not? What if this pain is one you got to deal with for the rest of your life? Would you rather live with pain or die without it? Paul said, God gave me a thorn in my flesh. I asked God to take it. But he told Paul, my grace is sufficient. Now, I don't really believe we understand the gravity of what he said. When he says, my grace is sufficient, so sufficient in the Greek text means boundaries. Let the church say boundaries. So when he says, my grace is sufficient, he's not telling Paul, I'm going to give you grace to deal with the thorn. He's telling him, my grace is the thorn. Because the thorn keeps you within your boundaries. So are you willing to let his grace be sufficient? All right, let me move on. Uh, this was a horrible after, no, after Mark's Gladness sermon. Number five, pain can be positive because when we realize that God uses pain to guard and protect me. <laughs> this is a wonderful truth we don't realize. Well, pain is wonderful. I'm Listen, we don't often realize. How, how many of you realize... <laughs> Some of the whoopings you didn't want saved your life. <laughs> Listen, if, if, if Betty Joyce Brooks and Cato Brooks Jr. didn't whoop me, Gary would have. But because I was more afraid of my parents than I was the police, that grace was sufficient. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the thorn that kept me where I needed to be. Psalm 91 verse 3 says, God will save you from hidden traps and deadly diseases. There are hidden traps planted by Satan, the world, and the flesh, and God uses pain to save us from hidden traps. He uses pain to guard us and to protect us. Sometimes God will use pain to keep us from falling in the ditch. Yeah. He'll just use pain to keep us from falling in the ditch. Has God ever done anything for you that you didn't realize he was protecting you till it was over? David says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And we shout about shall not want. And we shout about lying down in green pastures. And we shout about being led beside still waters. And we shout about restoring my soul. And we shout about being led in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We get real excited when we find out he walks with us through the valley 
of the shadow of death. We get so excited when we get a table set before us in the presence of our enemies. We really shout when he anoints our head with oil and we holler of surely goodness and mercy. But what we don't realize is that shepherds to keep sheep in the boundaries to get to the house of the Lord sometimes so sheep <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to say it yeah. <laughs> sheep are so dumb <laughs> they don't know they're not smart They, they're just, they're on the, if you, and Google it. Google the, the no, they, they just dumb. They, they just, Google it. Or just go, pick up your phone and Google, are sheep dumb and watch, yes. It's, that's how you go get a one word answer, yes. And sometimes they're so dumb, they don't know they're getting themselves in trouble. That's why he had to prepare a table. See, preparing a table means he went to the, the shepherd, went to the field where they were going to eat, and they weren't smart enough not to eat poisonous plants, so he had to remove them. And so sometimes they get so smart because they're so protected. Because they're so protected, they're so well fed, they're so rested, and they're so watered, they think it's because they're just that smart. And then they don't realize the shepherd is making decisions for his sheep. And sometimes they think they're good enough to start making their own decisions. And they start wondering and they'll end up as prey because you know who like to eat sheep? Lions, tigers, and bears. They don't realize it's their shepherd protecting them from that. And they start trying to wonder. But the shepherd doesn't want them to wonder. So to keep them safe, he actually breaks their legs intentionally. Why would a shepherd break their legs intentionally? Because they know they, their safety and their supply is in close proximity to their shepherd. So if I can't walk like I want to walk, I know if I want to eat and I want to stay safe, I got to stay close to the shepherd. So they hop right behind the shepherd. Because they know they can't get away and get back. I'm talking to some limping sore people in here right now. God only crippled you because he wanted to keep you close. That's a good shouting place right there. That's why you're limping, because he wants you to stay close. That's why it hurts, because he wants you to stay close. And he broke their legs not for punishment, for protection. Sometimes God cripples you to keep you close. Y'all remember the story of Joseph, Genesis, uh, how everything in his life for the first 40 years just went way wrong, was mistreated by his family, his brothers didn't like him, his mother and father doubted him. He went through all kind of injustice and racism. He was taken as a slave. He was accused of rape, thrown in prison for no reason, but all the while God was guarding him and guiding him and growing him and getting him ready for greatness. And then when it was all over, here's what he said, Genesis chapter 50 verse 20, talking to his brothers who did him wrong, didn't even recognize him. As far as I'm concerned... This is what he said. God turned into good what you meant for evil. For he brought me to this high position I have today so that I can save the lives of many people. Let me tell you something, baby. It's going to be some people in your life that want to harm you. It's going to be some people in your life that don't like you because you survived. They're not going to like you because you're chosen. They're not going to like you because you have dreams. They're not going to like you because you have goals. They're not going to like you because you won't quit. They're not going to like you because you won't settle. They're not going to like you because you won't stop. They intentionally tried to break you. 
They are intentionally going to lie on you. They are intentionally going to prosecute you and persecute you for no reason. But you got to remember that what they're using to try to hurt you, God is going to use it to help you. There is no production without pain. And what happened after Joseph went through all that pain? The Bible says he got married and had two sons. One named Manasseh and one named Ephraim. Manasseh means he made me forget. Ephraim means he's the fruit. He had these children in Egypt. After he went through all the hell he went through, to get where God was taking him, he said, when I had my first son, he made me forget everything I have to go through to get it. And my second son is the fruit of my pain. So everything I went through was worth it after a while. Last one, let me finish. Number five, we can tell that Pain is positive when God uses it to grow me and perfect me. I'm going to finish this in three minutes. James chapter 1 verse 4 says, So let it grow. And don't try to squirm out of your problems. For when your patience is finally in full bloom, then you will be ready for anything. Anything. Strong in character, full and complete. As your pastor who is becoming accustomed to pain, my prayer for you is that after yours subsides, you will be ready for anything. Pain is the high cost of growth. Somebody said it earlier, no pain, no gain. We want the quick solution. We want an easy fix. We want a pill, a seminar, a shot. Let's go change everything. But without the process, you don't get the maturity. Maturity is a process. For anything to mature, it has to go through a process. Instant and maturity don't go together. I'm just trying to get you to understand the very thing that the devil is trying to use to discourage you, God is going to use it to develop you. Let me, let me read James chapter 1 verse 4 again in the message paraphrase. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so that you become mature and well developed. Dr. J.I. Packer wrote these words, God uses chronic pain and weakness along with all other afflictions as his chisel for sculpting our lives. Pain, what pain does? It deepens your dependence on God for strength. The weaker you feel, the more you lean, and the more you lean on him, the more you grow spiritually. Galatians chapter 3 verse 4 says, has all your painful experience brought you nowhere? After all you've gone through, have you learned anything? The goal of this series is for us to learn in 2024 not to waste one hurt. Every tear counts. Tell your neighbor every tear counts. First Peter chapter 4, verse 19. So if you are suffering according to God's will... Keep on doing what is right and trust yourself to the God who made you, for he will never fail you. I'm done. I'm done when I say this, so Marcus, y'all can start playing. Uh, There's an eminent psychiatrist named Scott Peck. He wrote The Road Less Traveled. Here's what he says. Because we fear pain, almost all of us, to a greater or lesser degree, attempt to avoid our problems. 
We procrastinate, hoping they'll go away. We try to ignore them. We try to pretend they don't exist. Fearing pain, we do these things. We attempt to get out of them rather than suffer through them. This tendency to avoid problems and the emotional pain that's inherent in them is the primary basis of human mental illness. You will drive yourself mad trying to act like what hurts don't hurt. You will drive yourself mad trying to act like what you were facing isn't there. God never designed us to avoid pain. He wants us to let he wants us to let him repurpose our pain. All this talk we've been having all year setting goals, nailing stuff to the cross listening to the word what I'm telling you is before it gets better it's going to get worse and I don't want you to have done everything you've done already and give up because it gets tough anybody here used to run or now you run You've heard of what's called the second wind. You know what happens before you catch your second wind? It hurts. The more it starts to hurt right here, the closer you're getting to your second wind. Keon just told us a couple of nights ago about the eagle. To live an extra 30 years, she has to submit to 150 days of pain. My best friend, who go, he's going home to be with the Lord now. Many of you know him, Kelly Taylor. Uh, On July 27, 1990, while I was celebrating turning 18 years old, KT was shot at close range. They didn't think he was going to live. He had to go through emergency surgery. And when he came out of surgery, the first thing they did was get him up out of the bed and made him walk. And he said, "Uh, T, while I was walking down the hospital hallway, I told them it hurts too much for me to walk put me back in the bed and the nurse looked him in the face and said son do you want to die he said no she says well realize sometimes it hurts to live and I want to pray for those who are making a decision to live. Not just breathe and wake up and go to sleep. To live. To be fruitful. To live. To make a difference. To live. To soar. To achieve. To move. Scripture in the Bible talking to lepers, they say, Why sit here and die? This is the point you got to choose. Whether you're going to live or die, both are a process. If you're ready for this prayer and this sermon spoke to you, I want you to just stand where you are.
All you really need to do, and I know all you really need to do makes it sound simple. It's not simple, but it's not a lot of choices. To live through what you're going through, you have to decide, I love God more than I love my grief. more than I love my pain one thing I love is some good chocolate chip cookies one thing I love is a good old fashioned glazed donut and if you got a butter cake from Mastro's I'll give you all my goods half my goods I give to the poor <laughs> but sometimes what I love keeps me from my goals and so I have to decide whether I love my goals more than I love my greed do I have more discipline than I do desire sometimes I'm not worth it to me but God is worth it to me so what we're gonna do is we're gonna worship together right now we're gonna worship together right now and then after we worship together, I'm going to come and I'm going to pray for us. And then I'm going to extend an invitation for somebody to meet Christ today. I'm going to extend an invitation for somebody to unite with baby today. But I wanted to close with this message. I want you to get this message in your life. I want you to get it in your heart. I want you to get it in your spirit. And then we're going to talk to God. Y'all come on, say amen for baby worship. I will bless you, oh God. Lord, I love you and I adore you with my whole heart. I will bless you. Help me say, Lord, I love you. I adore you. I adore you with my whole heart. I will bless you, oh God. Lord, I love you. Lord, I adore you. With my whole heart, I will bless you. And I'll say hallelujah, hallelujah, oh hallelujah. I'll say hallelujah. Help me say. Cause you're worthy of glory, God. Yeah. That's the least we can sing to you, God. Hallelujah. For we're worthy, 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 worthy. Say, Lord, I love you, Lord, I love you. And I adore you.
up with Jesus. Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. From the bottom of my heart, I love you, Jesus. Lord, I love you. From the depths of my soul, I love you, Jesus. Lord, yeah. adore you. God, we understand and we, we've heard your voice and we realize the direction this next season of our lives are about to go in. God, it's not ironic that after we finish the time of hearing from you in a way that gets us started, gets us excited and builds us up, and right before this season comes where we remember what you went through before you went through the cross. God, we're getting ready to go through our own tribulation. We're getting ready to have our own Garden of Gethsemane. We're getting ready to have our own cross to bear. God, I pray that you will give us the strength and the sight to see that you are working in front of us. You're working on side of us. You're working behind us. You are making our way plain. You are preparing our way, and you're preparing us for our purpose. Now, Father, I pray that you'll hold us near. When tough times come, Father, draw near to us. When painful times come, God, draw nearer to us. Let us feel your strength. Let us feel your presence. Keep us going. Dry our tears. Lift our bowed heads. And then, Father, I'm praying for some that you will speak to them, Holy Spirit, and save their souls right now. I'm asking God for you to speak to some. Add them to our local family right now, God. We want to do life together. We know that we're better together. And, God, you've made it necessary. You've made it evident. You've made it obvious to some people that today is their day, God. Well, they're anonymous to us, but thank God they're obvious to you. But when you make them known to us, God, we promise you we'll receive them the same way you received us, with open arms, with love, joy, and gladness. We thank you, God, for what you're going to do in these next few moments. And we pray this prayer in the name of Jesus. And all the people said together, amen. amen. While you're standing, somebody today, this is your day to receive Christ. This is your day to meet Jesus. This is your day to unite with the Bayview Church. This is the day you're going to find your San Diego church home. I said San Diego church home on purpose because some of you are not going to be here forever. You're here temporarily. But let me tell you something. I know you have a home where you come from, but you don't have to disconnect from the church you left to get connected at the church where you are right now. We'll settle for being your San Diego church home until God says that time has come to an end and you move on from this place. But I don't want you to leave here the same way you came. So if you're ready to receive Christ in your life as Savior or you're ready to unite with the Bayview Church, just step out into the aisle nearest you and make your way down front. If you're in the balcony, come down those stairs. Be careful. Come through the first open doors you see. If you're on the main floor, just step out into the aisle nearest you and make your way down front. We're looking. We're excited. We're expecting. We, we would be honored to be your church family. I would be honored to be your pastor. But the decision has to be yours. Come on, baby, you help me welcome my brother. Come on, baby, you can better than that. Help me welcome my brothers to our baby family. Can you help me give God praise for the worship and the word today? Hey, Amen. You can take your seats. You can take your seats. Y'all can take them to the back. Listen, somebody's watching. Somebody's watching. Here's 
what I want to tell you. I know you wanted to make a decision today. You, you want to receive Christ in your life, or maybe you wanted to unite with our Bayview Church family virtually. Here's what you can do. You can send me a text message. The number you're going to text is 619-822-1560. 619-822-1560. If you're receiving Christ, text the word I believe to 619-822-1560. If you've already received Christ and you want to unite with the Bayview Church, you text the word I belong. Whether you're watching or whether you're sitting in here, you can send either one of those text messages. When you send that text message, give it a few minutes. You'll get a response from us very soon. In that response, there'll be a link. Click it, fill out the contact information, and we'll contact you this week. Whether you text I believe or I belong, let me be the first to say welcome to the Bayview Church. We love you and there is nothing you can do about it. One more time, help me give God praise for our day today. Y'all give God praise for Bayview Worship. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bayview Worship. On Resurrection Sunday, the fifth Sunday of this month, three weeks away, is when we're going to baptize next. So if you uh, need baptism, you want to register for baptism, you can text the word baptism to 619-822-1560, or you can call the church office uh, Monday through Thursday. We can get you connected if you want to get baptized on Resurrection Sunday. Uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to announce anything else. If I am, I forgot it. And I left that card downstairs, and so we just go, I'll get it to you tomorrow. I get it to you tomorrow in the E News update. Uh, all of our guests, please stand right now. You don't have to say a word, just stand where you are. We, we just want to celebrate you. Come on, baby. Help me celebrate our guests. Now, guests, if y'all would do me one big favor, look at me, guests, look at me. If y'all would do me one big favor, if you'll grab all of your belongings and anybody that came with you, and you'll come and meet me, come right through these doors. There's a room behind the choir saying, I have a reception prepared for you. I want to give you some free refreshments, but really, I just want to look you in your eye and thank you for worshiping with the Bayview Church today. Bayview, can you help me appreciate our guests as they are coming? Y'all bring my guests in the back. I told Ken, bring my Ken something like a guest. He ain't been here since 1989. <clears throat> Let's stand up, baby. We're going home. Don't forget, make your way to the MLK Auditorium right now. You still have time. Make your way to the MLK Auditorium and just walk through her story. I'm excited to see uh, who we're going to learn about today and to continue to celebrate uh, this, uh, you know, this Women's History month especially the women in our culture i love you i appreciate you you are amazing and without you we wouldn't be us and so thank god can you help me appreciate all women in this women's history month <laughs> women look listen to this women as we celebrate your history keep on making history all right Amen. deacons will be at the doors for those who are giving as we are leaving father we thank you we honor you and we love you. In this moment, we are so grateful that you've added to our church family. Thank you for our brothers who united. Thank you for those who are sending text messages right now. Thank you for what you've done in our, in our lives. This past week, thank you for reviving us, renewing us, refilling us, and refreshing us. Thank you for safe travel for Pastor Keon and the, those from the Lighthouse who came. God, I'm praying that you're breathing in their worship experiences right now. As we leave, God, we give. As we go, we give because you've been so generous to us, and we, th we say thank you. And we pray that as we're giving today, God, we, nobody will miss a meal or a bill because they're sharing, they're sowing seed in good soil because you are good soil. And then as we go, God, I pray that you'll bless our fellowship as we walk through this Her Story exhibit. Let this exhibition be enriching and encouraging and educating to all of us to remember women who've come our way and made a difference that's still making an impact today. And I pray that you'll encourage and inspire women today and the rest of this month, the rest of our lives. God, I pray that you'll continue to pour into those vessels that you want to use in your service. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the sweet communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit and the love of God be with us now, henceforth and forever. Let's all say together, amen. Love you, babe. You face the outside aisles for an orderly dismissal. If you're in the balcony, please, ma'am, please, sir, hold on to that rail and be careful coming down.